Police say more than two dozen people were involved in two separate attacks last night. Both of these violent crimes were committed by large groups of people, many of them teenagers. Detectives question 10 suspects they have in custody, but say more than a dozen are still on the run. Well, that's reassuring, kind of. Police investigating two violent attacks that happened just hours apart in Times Square. This same area, you have multiple migrant shelters. This is the location where two NYPD officers were attacked by a group of migrants just last month. This knife and this broom handle, police say, were involved in an attack seen from surveillance video near 8th Avenue and 42nd Street. So what does all this say about safety in that area? Everything just seems out of control. I mean, it's definitely not something I've seen in the last 12 years that I've lived here. ICE confirming that two of the suspects in this case are members of a brutal Venezuelan gang. That gang is called Tren de Aragua. So here we are, just south of Times Square. And right now there's a manhunt going on for 16 different people. And if you add to that two outstanding suspects from another incident, that's 18 people who may have done something that the police are looking for. They could be literally anywhere. This is a big city. And both these attacks occurred within two hours of each other right here in Times Square. However, since the asylum crisis began, over 170,000 people have come to New York seeking a right to shelter. And even though asylum seekers have been involved in some of these incidents, that small minority of people does not represent the majority, many of whom have come here fleeing extreme poverty. And as you'll soon see, local New Yorkers have been arrested in some of these very same incidents as well. And there are disturbing coincidences between these three attacks, which city leaders do not want to talk about. But before we uncover what these recent events mean for New York City and its sanctuary status, it's important to understand that critics are saying this could just be the beginning of a much larger, much more frightening trend here in New York. A 19-year-old charged in the attack on cops is now accused in a robbery and questions are growing about why he was let out in the first place. Eyewitness News report. So this is one of the asylum seekers who was arrested in the police attack a month ago, released without bail, and then rearrested arrested after a shoplifting incident. That's a lot of arrests. Now you'd imagine that somebody who recently was arrested for attacking the police would lay low for a while, but no, that's not what happened. And critics are blaming New York City's consequence-free environment for proliferating this type of activity. And they say if somebody can attack the police and then get released, it should come as no surprise when they do something else that is also against the law. But this very same person was arrested a second time, and maybe this time they learned their lesson. Remorseful? Maybe it looked like that at first. Look a little closer. The 19-year-old repeat offender cracked a smile once inside the back of the cop car. Police benevolent Doesn't seem like they learned anything, and they're smiling because they understand that the justice system will probably treat them the same way this time as it treated them last time. After all, if you shoplift in New York City and the amount is less than $1,000, it's only considered to be a misdemeanor. And critics say watching videos like this explains a lot, and it also explains why we as New Yorkers should get used to hearing about more and more incidents like this as time goes on and the laws remain the same. And once you understand the shocking events that unfolded right here, you'll understand why. So right behind me is the Candler Building. It's one of the shelters for asylum seekers here in the city, and this is the location of the 18-person attack where some of the folks had weapons and one person ended up in the hospital. Now, to be clear, there is no direct connection between this facility and those attacks. But not only is this the location of two recent back-to-back -back incidents. This is the location where two NYPD officers were attacked by a group of migrants just last month. The Candler Building being used as a shelter for migrants right now. So there's a lot here, but what nobody's talking about is that one of those arrested was a 22-year-old from Queens. This individual was arrested and charged with gang assault, assault, and criminal possession of a weapon. And the fact that this group was a mix of individuals could mean that those who wish to commit crime are banding together in ways authorities did not predict. And the scary part of this is that 16 people from the first attack, we'll get to the others, are still out there and have not been caught, even with all the video surveillance footage. This is one of the most surveilled parts of the city. There's literally cameras recording everything pretty much everywhere, but these are only useful after the fact. They don't prevent anything from happening, and they're not even accurate enough to help identify who police should be looking for. And honestly, how much are cameras supposed to do when the criminals know the justice system here is going to set them free? This is that attack. Police say that as many as 23 people 
were involved in the attack that happened at 5.30 Thursday evening. So as you can see, this is basically just an uncontrolled mob of individuals running around doing whatever they want. The attack also took place during rush hour near one of the busiest subway stops in the city. And you've got to wonder why there was no police presence here during that time. One would think that the presence of officers would deter crime. But a large gang of people taking over the streets, that's incredibly frightening. Some of the other assailants involved were teenagers 16 and 14. And at this point, there hasn't been a trial. We don't know how involved everyone was. But as minors, they'll most likely get light sentences. A 22-year-old and six others were taken into custody. Among them, three teens who appear to be migrants. But police continue their search for 16 additional people this afternoon. Now, look, so many people have come to New York City seeking asylum, and these stories do not represent the majority, but it seems like the city has been totally unprepared for this new gang-related crime wave. And gang-related incidents have been popping up all over town, including a wave of recent moped-related purse snatchings. Police recently apprehended a criminal gang that was using mopeds to ride down the street and snatch purses, phones, credit cards away from unsuspecting New Yorkers. But what's really scary is just two hours after this event took place, it happened again right down the street. Later, on 43rd Street near Broadway, another dispute turned violent. Three suspects were taken into custody, but police are still searching for two others. So this second attack took place the very same evening at 7.30 right here at the Hard Rock Cafe. And it ended with five people assaulting one person. And two of the suspects in that case are still on the loose. Now, police say there's no connection between these two incidents, which occurred very close to each other in the same part of town. But I think there is a connection, and I think that the city just doesn't want to address it. But these gang-related aggressive attacks are taking their toll on New Yorkers. Because if you're not safe in the busiest part of New York City, where are you safe in New York City? And directly across the street from the Hard Rock Cafe, there is a police station right there. They can see the building. Now look, this is not the fault of police. They have a very tough job. Pretty much everybody that they arrest gets released. That's very depressing. Plus, there aren't enough police. Everything just seems out of control. I mean, it's definitely not something I've seen in the last 12 years that I've lived here. Um, but if it's happening more often, it sounds like it's it's becoming an issue. So as you can see, residents are really starting to worry for their safety. Now, the glue that joins these two events together, observers say, is the get out of jail free environment that New York City has fostered with its laws. Because although New York City is already a haven for local criminals, some of those involved in the recent assaults were wanted by ICE. And critics say New York's status as a sanctuary city is exasperating the attempts of police to control the environment and keep everyone safe. charged in the Times Square attack against two NYPD officers are behind bars tonight after facing a judge. This is we're learning now two of the suspects are tied to a Venezuelan gang. That gang is called Tren de Aragua. Federal authorities saying this is just proof that gang members... So it's been about one month since the assault that took place on police, the first one in this same area, and the investigation into that is leading critics to say that the types of criminals taking advantage of New York's right to shelter rules may in fact be very dangerous. And since the police aren't in a position to cooperate with federal immigration authorities, now, 30 days later, we start finding out that some of those folks were wanted by ICE and were supposed to have been deported a year ago. But after New York City arrested them, they were released without bail. Wilson Juarez and Kelvin Servita Arrocha are members of the Venezuelan gang Tren de Aragua. ICE telling me today that Juarez should not have even been in the U.S. A judge and So that right there is very unfortunate. These guys were previously arrested arrested, but then they ended up here in New York City, where it's possible to get a place to stay in one of the city's shelters. Because not only is New York a sanctuary city, the legal requirement right to shelter applies to everyone who requests housing. It has to be given to them on a temporary basis. But it's important to understand that being a sanctuary city isn't just one rule. Rather, it's a collection of different progressive rules, which make New York more friendly as a whole as far as immigration is concerned. And many of New York City's right to shelter policies go back many, many years. For example, there is a 1989 executive order that bans city officials from sharing a person's immigration information with the federal government unless it involves a criminal matter. And
and apparently this order was reissued by several mayors, including Rudy Giuliani. A tough-on-crime Republican mayor who would never do such a thing. But critics say the worst sanctuary policies did not come until 2014 under the de Blasio administration, where laws were signed to limit cooperation between the NYPD and federal immigration authorities. Those laws removed ICE officials from New York jails, like Rikers Island, as well as barring the NYPD and Department of Corrections from honoring detainer requests. A detainer request is when ICE officials ask the NYPD or the Department of Corrections to hold on to a certain individual or to keep them in custody until ICE is able to come pick that person up. Today, such requests are very limited and can only be honored if the accused individual is involved in a serious crime. However, critics say the real problem for New York City is that criminal sympathizers are running the Justice Department. Because New York's sanctuary policies have been around a lot longer than today's progressive district attorney. Now they, along with five others in this case, are behind bars at Rikers. After their initial arrest, Juarez and Orocho were released without bail by D.A. Bragg, along with Jorman Reveron and Darwin Gomez Isquiel. So what's crazy is the same people who are in jail right now were originally released without bail by the district attorney who didn't think there was enough evidence to hold anybody at the time they were accused of assaulting police. And they used their newfound freedom to escape to Arizona where they were caught a second time. And look at this, the same thing has happened a second time. Another criminal has also escaped to Arizona. But this time, prosecutors in Arizona aren't releasing that criminal back to New York City. No, instead they're being held on separate charges in Arizona and the DA there says they don't trust Manhattan's DA to do the right thing. Yo, Henry Brito was the only suspect who was sent to Rikers on $15,000 bail, a source telling me that he was released this week after an activist pastor from a Brooklyn church posted his bail. Now the sad thing here is that even when police are able to successfully make an arrest of somebody who they've got evidence against, the justice system doesn't always back them up the way that they would prefer. But the individual who was released on bail is now back in jail because police have questions about where that $15,000 to bail them out actually came from. And apparently two of the suspects from that case a month ago are still out there. Wait, no, three suspects. And a lot of these folks had prior arrests for things like shoplifting, which had happened multiple times in some instances. This gentleman's apparently a wanted gang member who was released without bail, but then apprehended by ICE inside a New York City apartment. This gentleman is believed to be a member of a international gang. We met him earlier, but this gentleman here, he's telling the court that he's 17, but prosecutors are alleging that he's in his 20s. But the thing that doesn't make sense to me about that is how do we know anything about this person? If we don't know their age, how do we know that the name they're giving is the correct name? Your name and your birthday are on your ID. If that ID's available, they should know everything. But as frightening as all of these crimes are, humanitarians say that they do not represent the majority of asylum seekers. And many are frightened that the city may now be enacting new policies that will unfairly punish all asylum seekers for the actions of just a few who slipped through the cracks. So here we have some garbage cans on the side of the road, and these are related controversially to the asylum crisis. Towards the end of last year, the city claimed they weren't going to have enough money to empty them because the asylum crisis had pushed the city over budget. But now the city says they've got the money to keep roadside trash cans, and they're going to be able to keep them because they're reducing funding for asylum seeker services. And the reason that's frightening is because I spoke to somebody who works at one of the local shelters, and this person told me that asylum seekers do have legitimate problems getting enough food, and that's what humanitarians are afraid of, because it could be cut further. You're not going to see some of those draconian steps that we were going to have to take that will get in the way of the cleanliness and the safety of our city. Mayor Adams doing an about face. He says near So the controversy at first was how bad the cuts were going to be and how they were negatively going to affect New York City as a whole, and now the city's looking at another 10% reduction to the Asylum Seeker Services budget. And now the problem is that many of the families who will be affected already have very little. And advocates are worried these are vulnerable individuals who will now be put in an even tougher position because they'll now have less access to the things they need to make it out of the shelter system. But the mayor argues that these cuts aren't being made to make things harder for asylum seekers. Rather, the city has found more efficient ways to manage this large humanitarian crisis. And the cuts are stemming from savings involved from the renegotiation of contracts. Fat, bloated, no-bid contracts that just look like an absolute waste 
waste of money. And many of these costs come from the city's operation of over 200 emergency shelters. And since they were hastily set up and hastily put into operation, there is some financial waste involved. But now that the city has figured out how to save money, they're claiming no impact will be felt by asylum seekers. And they're saying that the city will now be able to continue hiring police. Under the old budget with the old cuts, the police would have canceled the last five or the next five academy classes. If we had to do the third rounds, it would impact garbage pickup. It would impact uh, services to our older adults. It would impact libraries. It would impact a series of services that you would actually see the difference. So these cuts, not just about police, not just about trash cans, the city also would have had to fire the people who take care of the parks. The former cuts would have also seen reductions in roadside trash cleaning. The cuts also would have seen libraries closed certain days every single week. But the city says they were able to report higher than expected tax revenues, so now they don't have to make any of these cuts. When combined with the reductions to the asylum seeker funding, which again the city says are coming from cost savings initiatives that won't have any negative effects. We are far from out of the woods, but we're showing that we can manage this crisis if we watch how we spend and we manage the spending that we're seeing in the city. So I guess this means the city won't be wasting 70,000 meals a month that nobody eats by throwing them in the garbage because their quality was repulsive. Yes, that actually happened. The city was literally throwing money in the garbage. But the real issue here the city doesn't want to discuss is that there is no end to the number of right to shelter requests they must honor. Right to shelter is the law in New York City. Everybody who asks gets free room and board on a temporary basis. And as long as the southern border remains in its current condition, critics say that laws New York Democrats and New York Republicans both contributed to will continue to put an unfair burden on New Yorkers. And for months, New York's elected officials have been calling for more leadership at the southern border. And what exactly do you think city officials here mean when they say they want leadership at the border. What do they mean by that? And is the asylum crisis a crisis of New York's own making? Or is it something else? Let me know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.